Okay, so we've done with the non-immigrant visa categories. Um, pretty good going, although I see we've been going for nearly an hour, so I want to make sure we have questions. So in regards, I'm going to go faster on the green cards. And the U.S. in the past has given as many as a million green cards a year. The numbers are big. I want to run through the categories generally before I dive into the slides. You have family immigration, and I'm not going to deal with family immigration today, but the truth is most green cards are based on family reunification, but then it has to be nuclear family. So, you know, people come over, they meet an American or even a green card holder, they get married. That's about 70% of the green cards right there, marriage cases. Um, of course, I tell everybody legitimate marriage cases, bona fide marriage cases. Please don't call me a fair the other kind because I don't want to be near them. Um, and then you have employment sponsorship. So family sponsorship also has um, four categories, first, second, third, fourth. If it's not close family, the waiting lines are long. Employment has five categories. Employee event one, two, three, four, and five. I'm going to run through them because it's worth learning a little bit about them. This first category here, EB1, we do have quite a few USC grads who've qualified. And it's very important for Indian and Chinese to try and get into the EB1 category because of waiting lines. And I'm going to talk about that. There's a 7% per country limitation on visa issuance. So China and India get the same quota as Liechtenstein and Belgium. Which is not really fair, but gosh, life isn't always fair. Um, so um, under the employment category, we've got EB1. This is the top of the top. Please don't call me unless you have a PhD and 10 publications, Google Scholar score, six to 800 at least. So that's a tough category. Outstanding researchers. Similar, difficult, but that's a sponsored category. So the point I made, but I didn't make it clearly, the EB1 can self-sponsor. So if you've got this kind of really well-qualified candidate, you don't have to do the sponsoring work. They can sponsor themselves, but that's really for the top of the top. And then the senior managerial transfers, uh, there's a green card for those as well. So that's the L1. So I think of the EB1A as the mother of the O1, EB1C as the mother of the L. All right, let's go on to where most uh, employers will be sponsoring if they do sponsor. This is called the PERM process. Uh, you have to show that there's no qualified US workers. That kind of sounds a little bit scary, but it's not as scary as it sounds. Particularly if you're a moderately big company, you batch them, you've got five software engineers, you run, they want two Sunday ads, so if you open your Sunday newspaper and you see all these positions advertised, they all perm ads. It's kind of a little outdated that you still have to run print ads. And yes, they are a little bit costly, but you run two print ads to see if they're qualified US workers and a few other recruitment methods. And the Labor Department will certify this as the basis for immigration if there are no qualified US workers. Um, process is pretty slow, takes more than a year, but there's something in there that I wanted to point out as well, which is the EB2 National Interest Waiver. This category has become increasingly popular because the foreign national can self-sponsor. They don't need the employer. So if this individual is involved in an area of research which is beneficial to the United States, for example, a STEM area, uh, and they have some considerable accomplishments. This administration particularly has been very supportive of the NIW in the STEM arena. So bottom line of what I'm showing here is there's quite a few paths to a green card. Let's move on to the next slide. Do you absolutely have to post in the newspaper? Can we post jobs on LinkedIn? Well, look, uh, I hate sounding like a 
sneaky lawyer. Um, but, you know, if you're going to post them on LinkedIn, um, firstly, it's very expensive as well. Uh, that is where people post generally. Let's just say for Perm, without getting myself into trouble here, because uh, it always sounds like, oh, well, are you conducting good faith recruitment? The regulations were made before LinkedIn and they require Sunday print ads for professional positions. So uh, that's the answer. Can you do LinkedIn as well? Yes, you will get, LinkedIn is one of the other methodologies. So there's the requirements. I mentioned the word good faith. You know, this is kind of a silly process to be honest with you. Because on the one hand, you have this worker, you like the worker, you want to keep the worker. But in order to keep the worker, you have to run ads for U.S. workers as to do this sort of hypothetical labor market test. It's silly. But you see there, you have three additional forms of recruitment, if professional. So yes, LinkedIn would be one of them. Radio ads is another one. So, you know, uh, there's numerous different types of recruitment methodologies that can be used, but this is filed with the labor department. I mean, you don't want to go through the process to get it denied. You want to go through the process to get it approved. So, um, yeah, this is what the labor department requires. And then once the permit has been approved, you go to the next stage, you file the immigrant visa petition to show that the foreign national is qualified. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, so this is the visa bulletin. If one Googles the word visa bulletin, it's kind of important. You'll see a lot of C's in there. That means current and no waiting line. But if you go to the second and third preference categories for China and India, and particularly India, let's just look at India. It is backlogged to February 2012. We are in 2022. So it is a fact that I think 60% plus of H-1B workers are from India, particularly in the tech arena. And a good percentage are from China in the PhDs and research areas. Why? Well, I think uh, firstly, large populations. Number two, emphasis on math and science. So we see these two large population groups providing a substantial portion. And the quotas are terrible. So these Indian nationals are waiting. You say, oh, Bernie, it looks like 10 years. No. It's longer. Much longer. These lines move very slowly. It's actually something like 20 years. Now everybody's like, oh, Bernie, come on, that's ridiculous. Uh, yep. It is ridiculous because the workers are very frustrated and some people are calling it indentured servitude because they can't leave, they can't start their own companies and they are stuck. So you will see a lot of the candidates that will apply for H-1B jobs are, have been here for a long time. And there's a rule that if you apply for the green card by the end of your fourth year, Repeat, if you apply for the green card by the end of the fourth year, it's actually fifth year, but I always say fourth year because everybody leaves it to the last minute, um, you can extend the H-1 beyond the six-year cap because, I mean, it's taking 10, 12, 15 years to get the green card, so they have to extend their H-1Bs in order to stay here. China got a lot better. Look, the Chinese waiting line for bachelor's degree says four years. Translate that into immigration language, it's actually six or seven years, maybe longer. We had an aberrational situation this year. We had double the employment quota. Normally it's 140,000 employment visas. We had 280 this year. That's a combination of complications from the prior administration and COVID. So visas rolled over and we have a very high quota this year. So this is the good news. 
Um, we may expect to see things get bad. The problem is the government has not increased a quota in over 30 years. Immigration is a very topical issue, as we know. Um, and there is a shortage of immigrant visas. This needs to be fixed, but that's when they talk about the broken system. But I'm not going to get into politics today. Actually, I am going to get into politics. I love quoting Ronald Reagan on immigration because everybody thinks of Ronald Reagan as this conservative guy, but he was Californian and he understood that his final speech is about how we are a nation of immigrants and how you can come to the United States and be an American. I'm an American. I know I have an accent, but I'm an American and I love America. And he goes on to talk about you can go to France or Germany or Japan. You'll never be a German, a Frenchman or, a, or Japanese. I don't know if you felt like you became a Chinese when you were in China, Addie, but you don't. It's, it's hard. It's hard to. It's very hard. You are not, you're not, you're not going to be Chinese if you go to China. But you can come to America and be an American. And even if you're not fully accepted, I feel fully at home. And that's why I love America so much. And that is truly one of the great things. That's coming from Ronnie Reagan, everybody. The guy who gave us amnesty, the conservative Republican. So politics have changed, but I don't want to get into politics. I just like saying how pro-immigration Ronnie Reagan was and George Bush Jr. and George Bush Sr. So, you know, it's not just, a Republican versus Democrat thing. A lot of Republicans traditionally felt immigration was good for our nation. 